All right, today we're going to take a look at the great man of war. You see his past performances here. Um, at the end of the last century, year 1999, you had Blood Horse Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and the Associated Press. Each of those three entities um, formed a panel of experts. They wanted to determine who they felt was the best racehorse of the last century. Uh, the consensus for each one, they came out, Man of War rated the best horse of the century by Blood Horse, Sports Illustrated, and the Associated Press. Here you see an old-fashioned version of Man of War's past performances. Uh, th this is actually his uh, PPs going into his final career start, which was that great match race, the famous match race with Sir Barton. You see uh, on the left here, uh, this is a big difference between the old past performances of the 1920s and the more modernized ones. These ones did not have um, dates in them. Rather, they had index numbers. You see index number 50,253. What they would do in those days is that they would have chart books. So you'd have to buy the daily racing form, and you'd, ha you'd also have to keep up with buying chart books. Um, and this is why you don't see any comments in the running. What you would do is you would go to your chart book, you would find this chart number, and you would get a chart for the entire race, like a, a full result chart, just like what you see Equibase print. Um, the racing form used to have that printed in his chart in their chart books. Now, I think it's very debatable whether or not Man of War really was the greatest racehorse of the last century. But what's not debatable is that he was one of the most important horses, if not the most important horse to the sport of horse racing from a marketing standpoint. Why is this? You look here, it says in 1890, there were 314 operating tracks across America. By 1908, only 25 tracks survived. Racing was outlawed at one time or another in every single state except Kentucky and Maryland. This was when the temperance movement was going on. Of course, you had to, the temperance movement had a prohibition uh, you know, against alcohol. Prohibition happened you know, not long after their attacks on horse racing. They're very successful attacks on horse racing. And you see here, even, even racing in New York was shut down for two years. That was in the early 1910s. There was no Saratoga meat, no Belmont steaks, no Belmont meat. Uh, 25 champion thoroughbreds were shipped to, uh, overseas. Virtually all of the leading jockeys and trainers in America also went overseas. How strong were the anti-racing forces at the time? Well, you read here, the most peculiar phrase, this is when Louisiana, they had a, a bill introduced to try to stamp out the sport in the state. And of course, Louisiana is a big horse racing state. Anyway, the most peculiar phrase of this latest fight is the report that the Ku Klux Klan and the Louis, Louisiana Federation of Catholic Societies is behind the latest attack on the sport. This would indeed be an, a unique alliance. Um, obviously, the Catholic Church, um, you, you know, and the Klan didn't see eye to eye on too many things, but one thing they definitely did, um, you know, was th that they felt the sport of horse racing was immoral. And the reason why they felt it was immoral then is because of, um, you know, the system of betting in that period of time, that sort of, you know, Gilded Age and post-Gilded Age um, system of betting was bookmaking, and you could bet on credit, you know, just like you get credit today to, you know, purchase a car or purchase a house. In those days, you could uh, get credit to, you know, to bet horses. You had the pool rooms. Um, you had bookmakers operating in the ring at the racetrack. So this was just, um, you know, for the Bible beaters and for, you know, the morality, uh, you know, the morality camp type people. This was just a horse racing to them was something that had to be opposed, had to be stamped out. Um, it was basically their alcohol before prohibition. You know, they, they wanted racing done with and they had, um, 
you know, devastating effects on uh, American horse racing. I mean, just, just, cr just, I mean, New York. I mean, can you imagine no horse racing in the state of New York? And it was like that in several states. It was just devastating. Which takes us right back to Man of War. Take a look at the field sizes for Man of War's races as a three year old. Uh, match race, four horse field, two horse field, match race, match race, three horse field, three horse field, match race, match race, match race, three horse field. Now, there's two reasons for this. Uh, one, obviously, is that he was a great two year old. And, you know, heading into his three-year-old season, he won the Preakness off the bench. No one really wanted to try him if you were a three-year-old. You, you kind of want to avoid him and, and try to go to other spots. You see, Man of War only ran against uh, older horses twice in his uh, entire life. And, you know, he, they, both of those were match races. So, um, obviously, the competition at the time didn't want to face him. Uh, but the thing that gets overlooked with a full crop sizes, just 1,680 horses in Man of War's full crop. That 1907, I'll say it again, that 1917 full crop uh, in North America had 1,680 horses. That's all of the U.S. and Canada. And Canada really wasn't hit as hard by um, the temperance movement as American racing was. You see this match race here. With Sir Barton, this great match race was actually in Canada. Um, so it, it makes things complicated in terms of Man of War's legacy, but I think it's something that gets, um, you know, very brushed over uh, by, by people now who just, um, you know, naturally feel like, you know, Man of War was obviously the greatest horse of all time. I, you know, I, I think there's some debate about that. Indeed, the legendary Daily Racing Forum columnist uh, John Hervey, who was Man of War, was like right in the, the heart of his career um, with the Racing Forum. He wrote about Man of War, a deluge of superlatives. Personally, I have always regarded the reputation of Man of War as overblown to the discriminating, the fulsome, the perfervid bunk and hokum that have marked his career from the publicity standpoint have prejudiced rather than elevated his prestige. The deluge of superlatives, the flaming headlines proclaiming him the wonder horse of all time and the like have nauseated many turfmen well competent to judge of greatness. That he was a marvelous racing machine and a speed marvel as well, nobody for a moment wishes to deny. But the fact remains, and always will remain, that during his career of conquest, he never beat a first-class horse, or even one approaching first-class estate, with the sole exception of Sir Barton. And all the world is aware that the Sir Barton race was a circus affair, an out-and-out -out hippodrome, and that it never would have happened on any other basis, so it does not count. Sane and judicial persons are not attracted to Man of War by the hysteria. You kind of get where Hervey's going here. He sounds like a kind of a crotchety old man who's just, you know, annoyed by um, all the, you know, all the attention that Man of War is getting, you know, at, at the moment as he's winning you know, races and breaking records left and right. Um, you know, horses, they they can't control who's in their full crop, how big their full crop is. Um, you know, that's basically, you know, com that's completely, um, you know, completely out of their control. But um, the criticisms here for, um, you, you know, the over-publicizing of Man of War during his time, you have to remember uh, the situation that racing was in. It needed a star. I mean, it really needed a star. The sport had been under e extreme attack from the temperance movement. And, um, you know, Man of War uh, was a horse, um, 
you know, there was just an absolutely sensational horse, first class star, um, kind of chain, the kind of horse that, um, you know, racing would want to change the opinion of people. But you see here, Herbie, uh, Hervey persists. He says, uh, you know, his racing career was chiefly marked by easy victories over mediocre opponents. The same is true of Man of War. Neither of these speed marvels ever definitely stamped himself a supreme racehorse in the same convincing manner that other horses have. Their admirers and sister that this they could and would have done given the proper opportunity. And they point in especial to Man of War's triumph over Sir Barton as proof of their assertions. But everybody knows that the Sir Barton defeated by Man of War at Windsor last October was not within many pounds of the Sir Barton of former days. And the race itself and the race itself proved as little as did Tenbroke's defeat of Molly McCarthy. And here again, we find a curious similarity between the careers of the two. Each said farewell to the turf in what amounted to a circus. Uh, you know, again, you know, you, you, you've got uh, the great turf writer here. He's, um, you know, he seems to be focusing on the point that Man of War, before, before that match race with Sir Barton, it was rumored that Sir Barton, um, you know, wasn't training well, wasn't up to his best form. Um, you know, he, he really seems to be, uh, you know, seems to be hanging his hat on that point, but, and even a decade later, you know, John Herbie, he, he would write a Salvatore. This is actually a misspelling in the form. Uh, the E should be dropped. It should be S-A-L-V-A-T-O-R would be his, um, of course, after the great horse Salvatore was his pen name. Uh, the DRF columnist would write under pen names in those days, but um, you know, under his nom de plume, this is uh, this was from 1933 when uh, a, a list was gathered um, from turf men, you know, trainers and and whatnot of the day of the, rating the 20 best horses of the time, and you see, Man of War came out number one. Um, Here's what Salvatore had to say. He says, every once in a while, somebody comes forward with a desire to tell the world precisely which have been America's very greatest thoroughbreds and why. Sometimes it is just a personal affair, a one-man show in which the particular steeds that a particular, and sometimes not too particular, selector has seen fit to parade before the public as the best ever. At other times, the impresario producing the spectacle does not rely upon his own individual opinions. With a broader desire to survey the facts, he gathers the selections of a group of turf men who are, according to his lights, competent to name names, or at least men whose idea on the subject, if not final, are interesting. Then he summarizes their findings and announces the result whereupon it is, as a rule, received in the accustomed way. That is to say, it is well picked to pieces by the critical non-jurors, and what they leave of it is seldom worth mention, only fragments littering the floor, whereupon the world goes roaring on its way, and things remain precisely as before. Nevertheless, it is a pleasant pastime, and gives an opportunity for praising the heroes of the past or dispraising them, as the case may be, and for starting an argument. And as devotees of the turf, for the most part, prefer an argument to anything else except a winning ticket, these periodical efforts to assess turf greatness always hold some interest to anyone who really loves a great racer. Very recently, still another anthology of the greatest of the great has been presented to us. It was anthologized by a metropolitan newspaper scribe who, in doing his stuff, followed the precedent of obtaining the views of various prominent turfmen and from them digesting the table of horses, which, as a group, they rate highest. Of course, to begin with, one may question the fitness of divers 
and sundry of the selectors to sit in judgment upon such a subject. Just because a man has obtained prominence upon the turf by no means qualifies him to decide upon such weighty matters, as many of these gentlemen are often known to be unable to pick a single winner on a day's current program. How, oh, how are they to pose as able to discriminate so delicately among the turf titans of the past, many of which they really know no more than the next man, if as much, and to tell just which ones to put in and which ones to leave out in a list of the 20 best since Longfellow? Let Echo answer. However, the scribe aforementioned went about among the men who, also as forementioned, seemed to him worth getting together in mass formation to decide the momentous question. And from their revelations, he prepared his little list. Here it is, its members being listed in the order of which they were placed by the selectors. You see Man of War, you know, folded 1917, number one, of course, you got Sisson B second, Colin third, Hanover from 1884 fourth, Exterminator fifth. He actually was an older horse who raced uh, during Man of War's time. They just didn't get together for a race. Man of War ducked him once, and then later in the year, Exterminator could have gone into Jockey Club and didn't. So these two horses kind of avoided each other at different times. But um, you know, the Saratoga Gold Cup was the race that Man of War said he was going to go in, and then you know they rushed Exterminator down from Canada, and Man of War passed the race. Anyway, Hindu is sixth from 1878. Of course, Salvatore, um, you know, the, the nom de plume of the writers named after the horse, who was seventh on the list. He, he, he had the record mile at Monmouth Park. And to this day, Monmouth Park runs a race called the Salvatore Mile. Anyway, you had Domino 8th, Commando 9th, the Philly Artful 10th, the Great Equipoise 11th, Luke Blackburn, just a, a great horse from the 1870s. I, I mean, he was, um, you know, he was supposed to be something really special when he was on his day. And anyway, down the list you go. But he continues, uh, one well-known critic who has already spoken his piece about the above list, would, in his own words, not only discard Broomstick, but make a clean sweep and discard Domino, Commando, Benbrush, Regret, and possibly Imp. Thus, you will see, here is one censor alone who considers that no less than six out of the 20 don't belong. I want that if the list were to be submitted to the tender mercies of other eminent hands, when they were done with it, it would look like a target upon which a bunch of aspirants for the rifle championship had been exercising their skill. Quite so. As for my own opinion, <laughs> I, I don't think it counts for much, but I feel constrained to remark that, like the authority quoted, I would also sweep out of it at least as many horses as he would, if not more substituting for them others now conspicuous by their absence. To me, a list of the 20 best horses from the day of Luke Blackburn, the senior of the 20, to the present that also includes, for instance, neither Henry of Navarre, Morello, Romer, Thurbador, Purchase, Crusader, Ray Count, nor Blue Larkspoor, narrowly one of them, and while including various mayors amidst Yotambian, Thora, and Wanda is a good deal of a joke, then again, just observe the rankings accorded the 20. In retrospect, to more than one of them, it is still more of a jest than the inclusions or exclusions just referred to. However, there it is in all its glory, if neither perfect nor indeed almost perfect, in its personnel, it exists an interesting cast of characters, all of which we may truthfully term great racehorses, if not the 20 greatest. And so you see, uh, pretty much no horse is immune to criticism. Even the great man of war, in the prime of his form when he was doing all this, and just after he had done all this, 
you know, he was still uh, uh, roundly criticized for um, not so much criticized, but you know, um, basically the attention he was getting um, and the accolades. You know, he was getting criticized by a top top turf writer for his day, which. I mean, Herbie certainly was an, a great historian, too. I mean, if you, you look at his work in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But anyway, I mean, look at this form on Man of War. I mean, you've got him, you know, as a two-year-old. His only defeat was in the Sanford. He gave 15 pounds to the winner. He carried 130. The winner upset carried 115. And you see here where it says slow start. He was actually... Um, one of uh, at least three horses that were extremely disadvantaged by the start that day. Um, they, you know, they were practically turned around. There was a, the regular starter um, wasn't at the track that day. I forget the story. I mean, I could go through the, um, you know, the old newspaper columns and find it, but I believe, you know, he, he had a death in the family or something like that. And, um, you know, there was a, rookie starter filling in and he made a mess of the start of this the Sanford and it cost man of war was one of the horses you know kind of victimized by the start they, obviously they had no starting gate uh in New York in the 19 in the year 1919 um but you know you see man of war comes back in the uh, Grand Union Hotel 10 days later and you know he only had to carry five pounds more this time he says East final sixteenth. He, he got the job done. He won. You know, skipped the Derby, but won the Preakness off a long layoff. You know, won the Belmont by twenty lengths. It was granted it was a match race. Um, you know, you see this hundred length win in the Lawrence Realization. Although this one, uh, this one was going to be a walk over here, and Hoodwink was owned by the niece of uh, Man of War's owner, Mister Riddle. And um, she she put a hoodwink in the race just because they they would um, they would cut the person half if it was a, a walkover. So that was um, it was within the rules. But uh, the the hundred length wins kind of a little uh, you know that, that really wasn't you know see he was one cent on a dollar. I mean that was a you know just a thing so he could get the full purse, but. The jockey club against older horses. Granted, the purse was only the purse wasn't very big, but this was a race where you really have to fault the older horses for not taking a shot against them. I mean, they just um, you know they ducked and he ran a mile and a half at Belmont in two twenty eight and four one under a pole, uh, just dazzling time. Um, a lot of the trainers. Uh, from that period would emphatically state that they felt man of war was the best horse they'd ever seen. You know, these times are great, especially considering, you know, the 1919, 1920, the disadvantages, you know, track maintenance uh, wasn't as advanced, you know, you had, you know, different shoeing, different nutrition, a lot of things, but um, man of war, Always ran. Look at the Travers time. Where's the Travers here? 201 and 4, 46 and 3 for the half. I mean, that that time's faster than the majority of Travers nowadays. And of course, uh, Man of War was actually the first horse where you would hear, uh, you know, people claim that they kind of would soup up tracks for him. Um, you, you know, nowadays, every time there's a track has their big day, uh, you, you hear gossip about, uh, you know, how they're they're going to make the track faster to try to get faster final times. But, um, you know, in Man of War's day, racing needed a star, and boy, did he come through for them. You, you talk about a superstar here. Um, so it's a, a – it was an interesting thing I think I'd touch on, but that's the great Man of War – 